Hi everyone, I'm Rick Beato. On today's Sounding Off, we have Misha Mansour, guitarist and founder of the progressive metal band Periphery. Coming up next. Welcome, Misha. Thank you so much for having me, man. Very it's welcome. Great. I got a question for you. You have really well shot videos. The making of your last record really well documented. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Documentary that you're talking about, Remain Indoors, that was done by Jeff Holcomb, which is Mark and our band's brother. And he's just very talented with that kind of stuff. I do my own um, updates, if you will, that are on my YouTube channel. They're terrible. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, uh, but that's kind of the fun. I, I literally... Uh, and learning how to use Final Cut by just like sort of hitting all the buttons. I think that's very apparent if you watch this. But Jeff is a very professional. It's totally kind of pro. I mean, the, the the I thought the the documentaries was really well shot and well done, well edited. I, I agree. I think he did a good job. You know, because because what he's good at is sort of sneaking in there and getting shots. Like like half the time we don't know he's filming, and like sometimes we'll catch him and be like, "You filming?" He's like, "No, <laughs> I'm just messing with some settings." You know, but he likes to get some candid footage and. Uh, um, and he's, he's really good at sort of like uh, weaving it into a, a coherent narrative because um, he wasn't even there for that long, believe it or not. Um, he was just capturing a little bit of it. But I think uh, between the interviews and, and everything he did, he did a really good job. We're, we're probably we're actually gearing up to record a new album and we'll probably want him to do something similar. One of the things that really wasn't part of it was the mixing process. So who, right. who did the mixing on the last record? Was it a group effort? So Nolly headed up the the mixing. Nolly's not in the band anymore, um, but but you know I'm I'm involved with that. I'd say mixing is something that I care a lot about, but I'm not that talented at. Um, I'm my my forte is definitely on the writing and the creative side. So I would sort of oversee the writing, uh, the pre production, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then when it came to to mixing, you know that's when Nolly would be heading it up, and I'd be there sort of as the wingman and just making sure everything's good. But I also kind of trust him to do. A good job because that's what he does. He's got a just a fantastic ear for mixing. When you guys are tracking, for example, on the last record, and you're using the axe effects, how do you guys differentiate your tones with it, and what kind of models are you are you using in there? So, so it always changes, and you know we get this question every now and then. We have three guitarists in the band, and you know I think there's a lot of philosophies as to how you would sort of record that. Um, the, the the three guitar thing is really more an answer to how we can perform this stuff live. Um, and also just for writing chemistry. Like um, I love writing with, with Mark and Jake. Like I like it so much that makes me not really enjoy writing on my own. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, we, we just, we, we write so well together. And then when it comes to tracking, it's the rule is usually just, you know, we double track it. Um, if there's several layers, then like, you know, it's really just whoever tracks the part best. Like, there's no ego about it. I've, I've had other people track my parts before. In fact, Nolly tracked a lot of my... Nolly's an incredible guitarist. And when, when we did Juggernaut, which was the album before that, he tracked a lot of my parts just because I liked the way it sounded better when he, when he played it. So it's really, like, the our, our what we do in the studio is it's really just about the composition and the final product. Whatever you need to do goes. Like, I don't care what, what goes into it. You're... you're we're trying to get an idea together. We're trying to get a musical idea. It's just purely a composition. And then the fun and the challenge is live. How do we sort of recreate and or approximate it um, with the tools that we have? And that's how we, we approach it. But even live, we use the same tone. So it, we're, there won't be like a Jake tone or a Mark tone or, or a Misha tone. We're, we're all going through the same tone. And on that album, we used, we were, we were going for kind of a minimalist thing on, on Periphery 3. So that's literally just, uh, Friedman uh, uh, BE100 and the cat and that's the rhythm tone like there's not really much to it um, and we always capture the eyes with everything in case we want to reamp but the philosophy is well you know because we have everything um, the DI is recording in parallel so that you can edit sure at, you can see the trans that way you have edited the eyes should you choose to reamp at the end Yeah. but we all try to get the best tone on the way in just you know and, and in the case of Periphery 3, this is what happened. Um, we were just like, no, that, that, that works. That works. No need to overthink it. Um, because in the past, we'd just gone like really overboard with a lot of that stuff. And I think we were trying to strip it back a little bit with Periphery 3. And it worked, so we kept it. You know. So you have a PV amp now yeah. that, that, you're, yeah. uh, that, that is a signature model. The in 
in fact, the 120. Right. It's it's sort of it's not even really a signature model. It's like uh, it's like collaboration. Okay. Sort of like a consultant on that amp, you know. Um, but but yeah, it was an opportunity to design an amp. And I've, I've said this before. I'll say it again. If you ever get the opportunity to design an amp with someone, you say yes. So that what is the, what is, is is there anything that it's based on? Like the, the yeah, initial. It's on the, 50, like a block letter, an old block letter. Um, that's that's how it started life. I think some people are very quick to just say, oh, it's a block letter with a clean channel, which it's not. Um, because, you know, we did tweak it quite a bit, and that's where I sort of learned how much of a difference, say, like the output transformer alone can make. Spent a lot of time on that stuff. You know, um, even at, like how you bias the tubes, how they come stock out of the, the factory can affect a lot. Um, that's a big part of why block letters sound different, I think. Actually, it's like they were just biased slightly differently, um, but but anyways, um, so so it's sort of refined because I was like, you know, I, I it, it's a little bit of like if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but also that archetype is very old and does not stand in 2017, 2018. So what what can we do? And it, and then it just became like a wish list, like, well, what would I have on my dream amp? And I, it was always a pet peeve of mine that um, high gate amps would have. Either garbage clean channels, no clean channels, or would have clean channels that would be good but just seem to not be appropriate for that amp. Like would have very dynamic clean channels. Yeah. The, the nature of distortion is it naturally compresses. So I always thought having a very dynamic clean channel with with a high gain amp never made a whole lot of sense. You yeah. know, and that's the kind of thing where you're really struggling to find volumes that work because. It's either too loud when you strum hard or too, you know, it's just hard. So I wanted something that was warmer and a little bit more naturally compressed, but that was still pristine uh, and something that would just eat pedals, you know, that you could just throw pedals at it. I mean, I, the design goal of that was that I wanted a clean channel that was so good that someone might buy the amp just for the clean channel and ignore everything else on it. Uh, and I think that was met. Like the clean channel is absolutely fantastic. You got two sequential serial uh, effects loops, MIDI control over everything. Wow. How Flies for for pedals because I was like, oh, this way you can have pedals in the loops and they're MIDI controlled and you can remote control. Like, let's say you wanted this was literally for me messing around at home. I had like my Strymon sitting on the the top of the, the the timeline in the big sky. I was like, man, I wish I could just plug these into the amp to power them, so I could just sort of leave them there remotely, right, and not have to have yeah, them yeah. On. So you can do that. Wow, um, that's cool. You can remote control the loops from the the pedal board, which doubles as a MIDI foot switch. Um, it's got a built-in overdrive circuit on channel one and a shared one for channels two and three, MIDI switchable as well. And that's, you know, I, I, I love to do this. And a lot of people love to boost high gain amps to tighten them up, you know, with, with a two screamer style circuit. Um, and then uh, it's got a noise gate in it because we're always gating that stuff. There's a lot of extra extraneous noise with this kind of setup and might as well have a nice gate on the end. So it's sort of this, all in one complete thing, uh, within reason, because obviously, like beyond that, any effects that you may add would become very sort of personal, and it doesn't sort of stop you from putting effects in and around it. But uh, I just, I just thought it would be a nice compliment for for all those features to be on on an app like that. And and I'm, you know, it took three years to design, so it was very time consuming. But I'm really happy with the result. You also have your pedal company, your Horizon Devices, the Precision right. Drive. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, about the development of that? Yeah, I mean, like that, that right there was, again, it's like, like I, like I alluded to earlier, a lot of guys in the rock and metal world like to boost um, their, their uh, high game amps. I can get nerdy with this, right? I, I feel like you're totally. the nerdy side of things, right? Totally. So, I mean, essentially what's happened is like everyone started to tune down lower and lower and lower uh, and use thicker strings and whatever. And what it does is it basically forces like, a lot like your tonal center is a lot lower, and the frequencies that are hitting the amp are a lot lower. Right. So, so a lot I, of these, you know, are very capable if you're in like E standard and you know 10 to 46 or something like yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. I think crunchy. But when you're starting to tune to like drop a flat or got lower, you have like you know 59 and 64s, whatever hitting the front end. They just can't handle that 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 information. It's just too much low end. You get a lot of that, you know. Yeah. It's not really, not really pleasant. It makes the amp sound very muddy. 
So that's where sort of boosting the amp, it, it actually cuts out the frequencies. And actually, a lot of people don't know this, but it's also like, uh, it, it's a high pass filter, but also a low pass filter as well. So it smooths out the tone a little bit. So you get this boost without it getting like super harsh or whatever. But what's interesting is it was always sort of older technology mixed with older technology that you sort of combine together to create a new sound. And I was like, well, I really wish there was one with like sort of an adjustable uh, low pass on it. Or, or a high pass, sorry, an adjustable high pass on it. That that didn't exist. So I was like, well, then we should make one. <laughs> and you know, long story short, that's like what sort of started the pedal company. I didn't. I thought some people would like it, but I didn't think this many people would like it. You know, it's interesting because in the past, when you do, when you record heavy guitars, I would always put things like a, if if you have down tuned guitars, put a tube screamer before it, or some type of distortion, which basically cuts the low end so it doesn't hit the front end of the amp. Right. And I would, or, or I would put a, you know, a Boss EQ pedal and, and duck the low end on it, things like that, always because it yeah. just tightens up the sound. So when I saw your pedal and what, what the concept was, I thought the same thing. Like, why hasn't anyone done this? This is brilliant. I couldn't believe anyone. I couldn't believe it. Like, it literally started with me just being like, well, I want one of these. Because the problem I was having is like, and I'm sure you've encountered, I can see you already have like two amps there in the back. I'm sure your collection's crazy. <laughs> so I have a lot of amps. And and the, the truth is, depending on the guitar, the tuning, even the tempo sometimes, uh, and the amp that you're using, the tube screamer, like a standard tube screamer will work to varying degrees. Like it works really well with something like a Mesa. You know, there's other amps where it wouldn't be quite as effective and it's because it was removing too much or not enough of the, the load. Yeah. And I was like, this is where it needs to be variable, especially with the tuning of the guitars. Because like you don't need as much if you're in drop C your low strings of 56 as you would in drop A flat and your low strings of 64. That's where you want to cut a bit more. So that's where I'm just having a little bit of a variable uh, uh, cut to it. And, and that's what we have as the attack switch. And the other thing was that, you know, these pedals always introduce noise and noise is always a big thing. So putting a gate into the pedal just seemed, it's Brilliant. just like, that way it's no cost. It's like you have this, but it won't add any extra noise to your to your signal chain. How, how gainy is the overdrive on it? Uh, very gainy. Okay. But 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 in in a tube screamer style overdrive, it's not at like full mix. You know, it's right. Like some, so it's a very it's it is a tube screamer style drive in that sense. So usually when I'm running it to boost a a high gain amp that's off or just very low, uh, but it works. It works actually very well. And the surprising thing is it works incredibly well as a as a tube screamer style overdrive because then that attack switch comes into play. Like you get some really cool tonal options. Like you have it all the way up to where it's cutting a lot of the wind, but you're on the neck pickup. You kind of can force that humbucker into like a bit of a single coil quality. So it, it, it ended up being this this really cool sh tone shaping device, and there's a lot of people using it in ways that are pretty different from what I originally intended it for. But it, I'm I'm just glad to see that people like it. You know, when I saw you your uh, video for it, because we've always done this in the past, taking these old pedals putting them in front of the amps for this exact reason. You know, the amps were not designed to take those really low tunings. Well, I think I think part of what what I discovered through this is, you know, people like you know, because you, you know what what's up and you're, you're a professional. But most people don't know. Most people think, oh, if, and we still get this to this day, you know, even with our pedal. They're like, well, if I buy a $3,000 amp, I shouldn't have to buy a pedal to make it sound good. And it's like, well, no, that's not, you're not really thinking about it correctly, you right. know? Um, sure, if you, if you plug in a standard tuning guitar, but like we're, our demographic is, you know, our fans, is people who tend to tune lower. What they don't understand is that like that is sort of an essential step, but that's not been communicated. And a lot of the people who buy our pedal, like will be one of their first pedals, if not their first pedal. So for them, it's more like, I don't know how to get good tone. And I'm not going to go in depth as someone like you or me would go. And, you know, that that's not what fascinates them. They just want good tone. Well, this part of this is part of the equation you may not have realized this but every guitar tone that you think is really awesome probably had a boost in front of it to compensate for the low end yeah you know? so that's just it's almost like educating them to that um but that's probably why it didn't exist because like the people who knew were already like that had a little studio trick right sure and that, they just didn't know i would have bands that would come in and they'd say why are you using a tube screamer why are you using a just a boss overdrive before the amp. I said, well, you need to take out some of the low end from the guitar because you're tuned down to C or down to B. And right. they, oh, wow, that's that's weird. Oh, man, that really tightens it up. 
right. you turn it on it's and off. Like, oh, you hear it, it's like, oh, okay, well, I, I can't argue with that. Okay, so I'm going to give you an easy question here. So what is the future of metal or heavy guitar-driven music? That's an easy question. Jeez, that's the hardest one you asked me so far. I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> I think if anyone, I think if anyone claims to know the answer to that, they're trying to sell you something. Okay, wait. I'll, I'll, I'll let me rephrase it. Will there ever be a band, a metal band, that sells as many records as Metallica did? How's, no, how's that? No one's selling any records anyways now. I mean, it's all gone. <laughs> it's all, it's all disappeared. Okay, so that leads me to my next question. Sure. These, these, these were obvious. This, that was an obvious thing. How do people that are in guitar bands? What, what do they need to do differently nowadays than they did 20 years ago, for example? Make income outside of the band. Okay. I mean, this is what I do with, with the signature products. Yeah. With devices, with get good drums. With, you know, it's, it's my way of being able to make a life for myself. I mean, God, like, you know, people think sometimes, like, Peripheries achieve, like, a, a little bit of success. We're not a massive band, you know, but we, we do all right. But we make no money. And people have a really hard time grasping that because even as you start to make more money, you, you'll gross a lot, but you'll net nothing. You know, and the way I look at it and the way I explain to people is sort of, you know, the the the, the ability to monetize music has just dropped by a factor of God knows what, 10, 100, you know, whatever. It's, right. it's, it just dropped and dropped and dropped. But the costs of touring are staying about the same. same. Right. So, so what it means is you just net very little. And then, you know, if you want to you're like us and you want to have a nice production. You don't want to just go bare bones on everything. You want it to be an enjoyable show. You spend money on that. So yeah, we'll net, we'll net a fair bit. Or, or sorry, we'll gross a fair bit, but we'll, we won't net a whole lot. You know, we did a five-week tour in Europe last year and we walked away with nothing. You know, and that's the reality of this sometimes. And European tours are very expensive. Um, U.S. headliners will do will do pretty well, but you can't do them that often because everybody's touring. And if right. you tour too much, you'll oversaturate your market and your guarantees, your guarantees will stagnate or go down. So it's just not a viable source of uh, of income for most for most bands. Some some bands are more fortunate in that they're sort of more merch bands and they can like really just kill it on merch. But it's tougher and tougher, you know. Like one way of looking at it is like let's say just for the sake of argument, your your ability to to earn has decreased by a factor of ten thanks to Spotify and downloading or whatever. If you are netting a million dollars a year. Well, now you're netting a hundred thousand. So yeah, you're still you can still make a living out of it. You won't be living as lavishly as before, but it's still viable. But if you're making a hundred thousand before, now you're making ten thousand. That's not a life, right? And you know, I'm I'm 33, and and as people start to to get older, well, you know, when I was in my 20s, I didn't mind sleeping on floors or whatever. It's like now, like I'm not going to be doing tours where I'm slumming it in a van. It's just not it's not fun anymore. It's not right. worth it. We all paid our dues already, so you know there's. It's just one of those things where, for us, music is just becoming more and more about just doing it for fun. But it's because we all saw this coming, you know? We had no delusions. When I started the band, it was like, yeah, you know, we're playing like nerdy metal. No one cared about us at all. No one cared about this style of music at all. I, didn't, I would have been amazed to get even 100 people to come to the show. So it was like, going to need to figure out some other way to make a living. This is just going to be for fun. And I think that is just more true than ever now. Well, you've really diversified, though. Amps, your guitar that you have, your signature guitar, your pickups, your pedals, right. your yeah, get, get good drums. Stuff. I mean, you have you're really an entrepreneur, and that's that's yeah, from out of necessity. Because, because you know what it's like with, yeah. with, with the business cycle and product cycles. It's like you know they start strong, they did. So if I'm relying on one thing, and then it's the end of the product cycle, I still have to buy food. You know? Right. So, if I have a lot, of, if you diversify everything, then you'll have income. Um, and the goal was to build up as much passive income as possible to afford myself as much free time as possible to work on music and, and have fun with it. So that music can be what it was supposed to be and what it truly was to me in the beginning, which was just a fun outlet. It wasn't this sort of sick dance that you do with the industry uh, where, you know, you start out with the best of intentions, but then before you know it, you're running a business and you're trying to ride this fine line in the music business. And it just sucks a lot of the fun out of it, man. Like, it's like, I'm trying to keep music fun. And now that it's entirely removed from my, my money making, like periphery does not have an impact on my finances. 
So now that now it could just be like truly the passion project that I always wanted it to be. And, you know, I don't care if no one buys our album because they weren't going to buy it anyway. <laughs> it's, not like, it's not like we're going to sell records. So, yeah, the day of the Metallicas and all that, it's gone. It's going to be something else. There's, there's bands that, you know, will get a ton of Spotify plays and make money back. But metal has always been a bit of a, a niche genre. And it's, you know, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I don't think that it's pleasing to most people so we're not going to be getting like billions of plays on spotify or anything like that i'm the kind of person that looks at the change as opportunity because i know it's very easy to be like oh it sucks and in some ways it, it objectively does suck but i like to look at the opportunity you know the freedom that comes with with this is that we don't have to do anything mm-hmm. Isn't like if we if we don't want to tour Europe again, we won't. <laughs> we will because we have some good shows there. But like you know, I think we're also going to be more strategic. There's a lot of markets that we've worked at for like a decade that have just not grown. That we don't do that well. That are very expensive. If we're going all the way out to Eastern Europe to you know break even on a show. Well, the gas that it costs us to get there means that we're actually paying for that show. Sure. That's subsidized by our shows in you know Western Europe where we get paid better guarantees. I don't know if that's worth it, anymore. and that's a reality. It, I mean, like fans can't have it both ways. They can't be like, well, there's going to be no money in this industry, but you still have to come out to our town. And it's like, no, like <laughs> we're going to get strategic with this. This is this is a cost. This is what will happen. And sure, if you're starting out and you're trying to build a name for yourself, you invest in in that. And we did that. We've done that for almost a decade now. But now we're at the point where we can just do whatever we want. We'll tour when we want. We'll play the shows we want. We won't play the shows we don't want to. Tell me about your influences, your early influences, and how you got into um, into playing guitar and and kind of what records were big records to you when you were when you first sure. started out. Uh, I think it started with the Nirvana's Nevermind. I was about thirteen or fourteen. And I heard that for the first time. Whoa, that's that's the sound, you know. Yeah. And that I uh, started play uh, drums and guitar. I actually started on drums um, and guitar. Uh, one of the huge benefits of being a drummer and having a band, <laughs> in, you know, in, in high school or whatever. I mean, we weren't a band. It was just like my guitarist friend uh, would, would would come over and we'd make noise, you know. And my poor mother would have to deal with it, but. <laughs> But uh, but one of the huge benefits is that guitar gear is heavy, so they just leave it all. They're like, sure. yeah, uh, I'll leave it. So I always had guitars there, and I'd always sort of fuss around on them. Eventually, I went to uh, university, and uh, then I realized I couldn't focus on drums. It's very difficult to practice drums there. Yeah. So I, fo- I was like, well, I'll focus my efforts on guitar, and that's why I started getting more to guitar-based music. And Dream Theater was just one of those bands that, like, I was like, oh, you can do that. That's crazy. <laughs> you know, like John Petrucci. There's a while there where I was just like, well, I want to be the best guitarist in the world, and that means I have to be John Petrucci. So I'd like <laughs> learn all the Dream Theater stuff, just try to absorb it as much as possible. Um, I don't know theory, but like I've always had a strong ear, so it was always like a challenge of trying to pick up as much as I could by ear. Though obviously, like my limited skills that that only went so far. So I'd also look up tabs and whatever. It was way beyond my skill level, but it also pushed me. I think it was really good for my chops. Um, and, uh, you know, that led to bands like Meshuga and then on the other side, things like uh, guitarists like Alan Holdsworth and Guthrie Govan and like, you know, people that I would say, you know, those sort of once in a lifetime musicians that you get. Yeah. Uh, who really are on some other, some other level. Um, and and I quickly learned that, you know, I will never be the best guitarist in the world. <laughs> I should focus on other things. Um, and I liked writing. I liked writing and creating, and you know, that's sort of what I started to focus on. But those would be sort of the the early influences. Also, bands like Deftones and Tool and Early Incubus and things like that. You know, sort of got me on the right path there. What do you think of the term gent? I think it's funny. You know, I, I used to be kind of annoyed by it, but, like, I think when, when you look back at it, it's like, does any genre have a good name? You know, it's, it's always some very silly story. I'd say probably this wins as far as, as the origin story being silly, but it is what it is, man. It all, and, and any of these things is just people trying to sort of organize their music. You know, it's, it's like one of those terms that I wouldn't sort of 
self apply but i understand if people call us even though it's sort of retroactive because i always just call this progressive metal and that was my, metal, my yeah. approach and the thing i liked about progressive music is that at least in theory and then you could do whatever you wanted if nothing was out of out of reach and you'd see bands like dream theater do that like throw these like sections and you're just like whoa where, where, where did this come from you know and you could never be too too soft or too heavy or too whatever i didn't want to have that limitation it's like oh well I'd like to do this, but it's too X, Y, Z. Like, and, and, and I'd like to think that Periphery has never been that band. Our, our rule has always just been, does it sound good? Uh, so in some ways, it's very simple to make Periphery music. But that, to me, is what progressive music would be. And we're, we're, we're a heavier tinge band, so that's where metal comes in. So progressive metal. But yeah, people will, will call us gent. That's fun. It's funny. Like, it's like now, now, it, now it's a tongue in cheek thing. It doesn't bother me at all. I always thought it was interesting though, that metal has so many subgenres that, and people do that just to categorize or, or actually to make their favorite bands have their own category. I always yeah. thought that was, uh, that, that was kind of one of the reasons let me, for that. Let me ask you, do you think that that's like, do you think that's exclusive to metal or do you think that every sort of bigger genre has that many subgenres. No, I think I think EDM has a lot of subgenres if you're talking, right. you know, I mean there's so many different types of ele right. elect electronic music. I always thought it was similar to metal, you know, when grunge came out. People lumped everything into grunge. Alice in Chains is grunge. Right. Uh, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Nirvana, and those bands are very different than they throw Stone Temple Pilots in there and they might throw in Smashing Pumpkins in there. No, those yeah, bands are right also term. different. They didn't like that term. They didn't they? like that term. No. It's kind of the gent of that. Of I think that no song. one like because it's like this new term, and it's like no one, very few bands from the first wave would ever identify with that because to them they thought they were something else. So in right. the same way, when we started, we thought we were progressive metal. Like it was very clear. Now all of a sudden you get called gent, which is like first of all like silly. Second of all, it's not a real word, and it's like and it's and it's just like it's a bit disarming. It's like wait no, but we're we're that. Why are you calling us this other thing? Then you realize it's, it's it's all pointless anyways. People just sort of, as you said, trying to categorize everything. But they do get very. Um, some people get very intense. I think music is a very personal thing to a lot of people. So I'll see I'll see things, especially like with with. It seems like as as the genres get more and more obscure, then it gets very. Uh, <laughs> like there's there's a lot of venom. There. Like for example, like God, like God forbid you call like a, a black metal band a death metal band. You right. Know, like, <laughs> start right? so <laughs> and, and and if you're that band that were um like i remember like bands like deaf heaven got a lot of crap because they were they would have like black metal elements but then it was you know sort of an indie post hardcore kind of aesthetic and that was like wrong like you can't do that <laughs> even though in music like all the the, the new music is basically sort of trying to try and some new mix of things you know that's really what it is so they should be lauded for that, but but instead they were given a lot of crap because that's how personally people take that. Oh you know? yeah, and um, you know I, I I think we've seen a little bit of that as well, like from like sort of true progressive fans who grew up with say like bands like Rush and Dream Theater, and, and, and we'll, you know if we call ourselves progressive, they'll be like, oh, but you're not a progressive band, and it's like, well, who cares? Okay, then we're not a progressive band. Or people with metal even, they'll be like, you're not a real metal band, as if that's an insult. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's all pretty absurd, <laughs> actually, right? It's, you know. It would be like an insult for someone to say that to their band, but like, it's just not, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> like, that's not, I don't go into a room being like, I mean, to make some metal for my, my metal band, you know? Like, it's just not, it, it, it's more, the, the progressive thing was always just a guideline of like, don't limit yourself. Who plays all the keyboard parts on your record? Your um, records? I, I usually program them. Okay. Uh, okay. Jake dabbles with a lot of that stuff too, though. Lately, he's been doing more solo stuff and haven't contributed as much to the records. But like, yeah, the, the, that's something that I started to get into. And especially around Periphery 3, I really got into that and sort of like orchestral composition. So like, that's why both of those things are, are featured fairly heavily on those albums. And I enjoy those things a lot. So they'll probably be all over the, the new stuff too. I think it sounds great. I mean, I think it really adds a, a uh, new element and those orchestral sounds and heavy guitar sounds, I think blend incredibly well. Oh, thanks man. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you think so. It's just, honestly, it was just, yeah, that point, I don't know, maybe, maybe you go through this too, but it was just, I was starting to just get very uh, frustrated with 
guitar and my my abilities. I was feeling very uninspired by guitar, and um, I wanted to learn more about synthesis. So I got like a, Mo a Moog Sub Thirty Seven just because I figured, you know, it's a Moog. It's gonna sound like it's gonna be. I didn't want to have a synth that like could sound bad, so that I would get discouraged and be like, all right, screw this. I'm not gonna do it. But so the, the Sub Thirty Seven is pretty hard to get sounding bad, but at least it puts you in a position where you can understand how, how yeah. synthesis. And, and it taught me a lot. Uh, but then, like, I literally just got it as a learning tool. But I was like, wow, this thing just sounds great when you layer it and put it in the mix. Like, it's just one of it's one of those things where, like, you know, analog versus digital synths, you can get great results with digital synths and, and software, and I, and I use them all the time. But there's something about analog synths, the way they just work instantly, it's kind of magic. So I don't question it. It just and, – and that ended up being all over the album. And then the orchestral stuff was – so I always was fascinated by, you know, that's very expensive, like to hire an orchestra and all that. I didn't know the first thing about arrangement. And it just sort of got to this point where like now, or as a few years back, you could do like very realistic mock-ups if you put the time in. The software is caught up. You know, it's fairly taxing on your system, so you still need a pretty powerful computer. But like it's at the point where you can mock it up and, it will, you know, it'll fool most people. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. So now it's this whole new world to explore, and that was just that just sparked so many ideas. So where I was once like, oh god, like I'm so sick of guitar, I don't know what I'm gonna write. All of a sudden, I am now flush with ideas, um, and I needed that. I really, I really did need that, and that is actually part of the reason why why Periphery Three came out so soon after Juggernaut is just like just had this rush of ideas from finding this new inspiration um, with these two sort of new worlds that I was exploring. What uh, what kind of um, software synths do you use uh, in, uh, for example, and I think on Marigold, you start with the string part. And so that, that's a combination of, uh, of, of, we actually hired some session guys after okay. that to, like, to play the part. And I just handed MIDI to a guy, Randy Slaw, and he like had, he transcribed it into like actual notation from the MIDI. Um, and that's layered over the top. So it sounds, you know, even sounds more. Sounds real, yeah. Library, but the library underneath that I believe is Spitfire Albion One. Great, which is a really good entry to if anyone is interested in this kind of stuff. That is the that's what got me into it. Like one of two things will happen: either you'll be like, "This is amazing, and this is all I need," or it will just open Pandora's box for you, like you did, and you'll spend way too much money on that <laughs> on orchestral libraries. Oh yeah, um, yeah. The the Albion but, One is the first Spitfire one I bought, and they, they uh, I've, I've bought a lot of their other libraries, but that's a really great one to start with. Yeah, exactly. It's a broad brush stroke, so you're not going to get like any individual sections, but it does divide it enough to where for most of your writing, you'll get what you need out of it, you know, unless you do like a ton of DVC stuff and you really want it to sound like, you know, the entire section playing it as opposed to layered section. But, you know, if you want, if you're curious at all about it, it's just a really easy way. It has a whole orchestra and, you know, including percussion and, extra stuff as well so it's like that'll at least be a safe way to dip your toes in the water without having to make the investment of like getting into the hardcore spitfire stuff right which which i think well it sounds like you know like will will definitely drain your wallet you use uh, an imac i believe right what do you use for D oh, it's a cubase cubase okay cubase you know I, I always relate uh like DAWs are like languages so you know someone who's comfortable in their language even if it's inferior in certain capacities, we'll just be happier speaking their language. Um, but as of Cubase 9.5, I can say, like, feature-wise, it's very complete. And Cubase has always been, in my opinion, if I were to take a very objective standpoint on this, like, probably one of the best dogs for pure composition. A lot of people like Pro Tools because, like, for engineering, it's just it really, engineering and mixing is very well suited, but it's it's a bit difficult on the, the composition side. Uh, I've actually converted a few Pro Tools guys who wanted a better DAW for comp composition over to, to Cubase. So um, I really like it for like the MIDI stuff that you can do in there is just incredible. And my yeah. workflow at this point with it is so quick that I couldn't imagine using anything else. But use whatever works for you, man. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my advice there. <laughs> well, I think I saw you break down Marigold in the past. I right? did, yeah, I did. And what's cool is like you can break down the theory, which is really cool because oh, I can't. I, I, I hope I played it right. Me, should I play it right? I, I, if I remember correctly, I think you you nailed it, and and it's a pet peeve of mine when people like miss the notes. Yeah, <laughs> like you know, 
I don't. I, think, I don't usually. I'm. I'm pretty good about that. I don't, I don't usually miss this. There were a couple. I, I, think actually, I think you actually like played it exactly right, um, which is why it, it stuck with me because I was like, "Oh, this guy knows what he's doing." <laughs> there were some stretches though that were. I was thinking, man, that's really. Well, that riff. That riff started out as like this symmetrical sort of pattern. Like, there's just certain things on the guitar that I guess certain moves that are easier. Or that just happened sort of naturally. That's one of those ones. So I didn't even actually know how to play it until I had to show it to someone because I was like, okay, this is what's going on. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, like, yeah. There's certain tendencies that you have, and like that's a riff I just sort of stumbled upon the very first position. And I was like, well, this sounds kind of neoclassical. Uh, and I was like, well, let's let's explore that. You know, and it's just kind of going up. But then as you're exploring that, it can lead you to some stretches because it's like there's notes I want to hear, but I have to stretch to reach them. Right. Uh, and like, you know, so it's like some of my riffs are like that, where it's like a general concept and it's like, all right, let's see where that goes. Um, and it may take me to some very uncomfortable <laughs> places for my head. When you guys are, for example, on the Periphery 3, working in your studio at your place, are the songs preformed or are you creating them at the same time? Are you mixing as you go? What is, what? how would you say that process works? So, so... It's kind of everything at once um, because I wouldn't say we're necessarily mixing the final product, but I do think that a big, big part of what makes these songs work is the overall mix and the sound. Like if they, if they, the, the mix was kind of garbage, it probably would hit or give the right impression. But we don't spend time actually like mixing the demos because we know we're going to re record it and whatnot. But it just gives a sense of it. And we're, you know, we'll have, I'll have, I have tons of like half finished ideas and like the guys have a bunch of riffs and I'm usually the one producing the session. So like, you know, they'll come to me with riffs and we'll try to turn them into the song, but we're writing on the spot, you know, um, and sort of looking at the sections that we have and answering them with like, it's like, Oh, you know, this, this gives me an idea for another section or whatever. But I'd say one thing that we started to do um, after periphery two was you know, I, I think the, the, the biggest flaws with our first two albums, especially the first, is that they were sort of written instrumentally and arranged instrumentally, and that we gave it to our singer, and we're like, all right, dude, figure this out, you know? Which right. is not, it's not fair, and it's not necessarily the best way to write a song, you know? Yeah. Uh, so what we'll do now is we'll focus more on, like, it's a bit more of an iterative process, because what we'll do is get a bunch of sections that work together, and like you'll have an arrangement, but that arrangement is literally more to show how these sections can flow into one another than, than be anything that's set. And oftentimes, you know, we'll show it to Spencer our singer, and I'll have written a section as a chorus. He'd be like, that's not a chorus. Like, that's a pre-chorus. This is the chorus. And then when he shows us the vocal ideas, we'll be like, oh, yeah, you're right. Like, that is. And that's not something that we were doing back in the day, but that definitely makes it flow a lot better. So... You know, what will generally happen and what will probably happen in a couple of weeks when I start writing, uh, we're going to start the periphery, the new periphery album session is like Mark and Jake will come over and we'll start to get these ideas together to where we have something to, to show. And then, and then likely Matt, our drummer and Spencer, our singer will come and we'll arrange, we'll try to get a general arrangement together as a group. And that's where the song starts to really take shape. And that's where Spencer will be thinking, okay, yeah, I probably want like this here, like that. And even then when he has it, he may extend, you know, the repeats or whatever, or like chop stuff around and be like, oh, I, I found something cool. And then from there, we'll just kind of, kind of take it. Spencer can produce vocals. It's what he does. He actually produces like in his downtime. So he has his setup and he, he can basically turn around and finish vocal tracks. Um, that, that oftentimes like the demos will be the final, <laughs> the final take because they're so good. So it's uh, it's it's like one of those sort of weird rolling processes that you know, thanks to computers, you know, and the modern world, you can just sort of roll with it and see what happens. And that's why I have no idea what our new album's gonna sound like. It's just we're just gonna kind of go for it. Does uh, does Spencer ever come back and say, "Hey, I'm working with this melody. I think I have a great melody, but we need to change this one riff or this one chord because it's not." Uh, I'd say it's sometimes the other way around where like I'll be going for a bit more adventurous accord change and he won't really be hearing it and I'll be like that note needs. So I don't know theory, but I can tell when something's in, I can tell when something's out and I can tell when something's out in a good way or a bad way. Right. I don't know why. 
I know it just I know it for the same reasons I know that that wall is orange, but <laughs> I don't have any scientific expl- explanation as to why I know that. So I could tell him what move what, what what notes to move those to so it will work and be in scale or be interesting. Um, and sometimes, yeah, I'll change the chord so it fits a little better for his idea because his idea will be like, oh, that's a great top line. And it would be even better if the chords change like that. I really liked in the, the making of with your last record how the, the segments where he was showing how he does his vocals and produces yeah. them. And it seems incredibly efficient that he can just punch him in himself. He goes yeah. for a thing. He knows exactly what he wants to do. He starts it. He, you know, it's... it's uh, that's funny, you know. I think a lot of people got a weird sense. Again, like Jeff was in town for like for not that long, so that was the only opportunity. Spencer like had just been out drinking that night and just on a whim was like, he's like, he was drunk out, and he was like, you know what? Let's record some stuff just on a whim. <laughs> um, and he recorded about three quarters of a song called Prayer Position, but he was so drunk that he didn't remember, and he thought that he recorded like kind of bad ideas, and I. Remember, I came over, I was like, hey, I recorded. And he's like, yeah, I think I got like a verse or something. We open it up and we're like, dude, there's like vocals over three quarters of the song. We listen to it and we're like, dude, this is great. <laughs> like, I didn't even know. <laughs> so, but like, it's weird. It's a weird snapshot because I think that was, it makes it look like it's this sort of candid snapshot. People are like, that's so sad. He's like recording by himself. He's got a bottle of wine and like he's like eating a, a sandwich. And it's like, dude, he was just wasted. He was so wasted, he doesn't remember doing that. But it yielded great results. Like you know, I love the bottle of wine. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was very, uh, very rock and roll. Was, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but no, but, you know, I, I guess, I guess the, the thing is that normally that's not what it's like when he's recording or writing. It that was definitely a bit uh, uh, of an outlier of a situation. But it, but that's what was committed to film. So it, it sort of looks like that may be the standard, but it's not. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's really handy that. Um, that he does. I don't know the first thing about recording vocals. I'm, I'm not, I'm not very good with that. So it means that it's one less thing we have to worry about and he can get his vocals sounding absolutely professional edited. He'll do everything himself. So we'll just get the, the, the tracks of it and it'll work perfectly, but we work sort of in, in tandem. Um, so while we're working instrumentally, he'll, you know, after we arrange it together, he'll figure it out on his end. And then he'll, he'll oftentimes have requests to be like, can we extend this? Can we cut this in half? Can we actually try moving this here? And, We'll just play around with it until it feels right, you know? Does he use Cubase as well, or does he use a different DAW? So how do you yeah. guys go between the two different formats? Does he send, will he send stems of his vocals over and yeah, just start that's a That's always a bit of a, a thing we have to figure out, but we, we can always figure it out. You know, it's, uh, it, it, you, you could send stems. Uh, sometimes you'll send stems and, like, I'll have, like, just the processing on, on other tracks so we can blend that in as, as because it doesn't always translate, like, when he's recording, it's on top of the mix, and then when we put it in, it's inside the mix. So, it doesn't always translate one to one, as I'm sure you know. But, um, but we we can always figure it out. That's not a problem. I mean, Nolly mixes in Logic, so um, then it gets transferred. Man, <laughs> yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, it's very inconvenient in some ways, but you know, it's like again, it's like whatever dog offers the least the the path of least resistance, whichever one just helps your workflow be as smooth as possible that will always be the faster way okay so you have a lot of amp heads there that i can see right behind you what uh do you have a collection of amps i have way too many amps in this place man it's like that is a uh a, a red g mesa that i just picked up the other day um under it is the invective i've got this uh driftwood mini nightmare here i've got this ksr aries here ah look at that um yeah i've got i've got a, a marshall silver jubilee i'm borrowing this milkman head from my buddy i've got a bong Shiva on the floor here <laughs> I, I, and, and i just like gear it's it's pretty pretty I, I have a problem so you know it could have been heroin i guess so gear is it, much better but uh better resale right better resale exactly <laughs> <laughs> and, and is there I, anything that any kind of music that you like misha that people would be shocked at well, actually, one thing that, that you know, seems to shock a lot of people is that I don't listen to a lot of it, um, which I think I wouldn't be surprised if you understand and anyone who's in the scene understands, but nobody listens to the music that they make, really. Like, no one, I don't listen to, I don't listen to Periphery unless I'm, like, unless I'm, like, practicing it or something, you know? <laughs> like, like, I listen to it so much when we're, when we're, 
uh, writing and recording and mixing and whatever. And then like I want after that, I just want silence or like something really different. So a lot of my music that I have is like very different styles, like chill. It's usually chill. And if it's heavy, it's because it's really different than, than anything else out there. Or something that's just really clever. But I'd almost say it's tougher for a metal album to make it into my collection uh, just by virtue of the fact that I'm biased a bit against it for listening to it, you know. Uh, I just enjoy making it, and it's my favorite style of music to play live because it's the best energy, you know. Do you but, ever uh, go back and play old songs where you have to relearn them again? Oh, yeah. I mean, I have to relearn songs every tour. I forget them. It's like when you cram for, like, a math test or something, you know. So, like, like whatever tour we're going to do next, I'm going to have to relearn all the songs. I don't remember my own riffs. Like, they, they disappear after a tour. Um, and for old songs, it's been bad. Like, I remember we were, oh, what song was it that we brought back? It was, like, kind of an older song. Maybe Luck as a Constant or something. But there was some old song where I was, like, really struggling to remember how to play the parts. I had to look at YouTube videos. and like <laughs> I had no idea how I was playing some of those parts. Um, or like look at the, the the sessions and see if I could pick out, you know. And then it slowly comes back. You're like, oh yeah, I remember. But God, like I'm not like and some people like I feel like like Tosin can like just play anything from his back catalog. He just knows it. He just pulls it out of nowhere. I'm like, I don't know how you do that. Cause like I could barely I, I wouldn't be able to play anything that was not on our set list. <laughs> you know? Like it, it would it would be bad. I think with our older material there was also a little bit if I'm being honest, in this sense of like, look at me, you know, like that first album, it's like, hey, this is what we can do, kind of, you know. Um, and although we have like difficult stuff on the on the newer records, it's a lot more intentional, you know. It's a lot more purposeful. Um, so it's really sort of logical, or it has to do with the music. Like, whereas on the, the first album, I think some of it was just like, hey, look, we're good at guitar, or whatever, you know? And that's <laughs> hard, man. That, like, I'm not good at guitar, so that stuff requires practice. <laughs> Concentration, and not necessarily fun to play. You know, that's, that's, that's just how bands start out. It's always a bit more sort of about the, I don't know if shock value is the right word, but, like, you really want to get a bit of attention at the beginning, man. As you get older, you start to focus more on like, oh yeah, we're supposed to be writing songs here, aren't we? <laughs> you know. When do you uh, think the next Periphery record will be out? Probably this year, sometime. Okay. I don't know. We actually want to take so we want to take a lot of time with this one. We've never had the luxury of doing this. Like, we're we're starting our own label, um, so now we don't have a deadline. You know, we've always had deadlines in the past, and with with Periphery three, there was just. It was a self-imposed deadline because we wanted to see... It was kind of a fun challenge. We always throw these challenges. But we wanted to see like how quickly we could do an album. Obviously, we never put out an album we aren't happy with, and we even pushed back the, the date on Periphery 3. But we were just feeling so inspired and so flush with ideas. We were like, oh, I bet we could do an album this quick. So we actually wrote, instrumentally, we wrote the album inside of two weeks. Um, and, uh, yeah, the whole process, I think, from like the first recording day to, like, Turning in the master, I think, was inside of a month and a half. Wow. Very quick. Excellent. Well, Misha, I really appreciate you being my guest today, and uh, I look forward to hearing uh, hearing new music here in the future. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. I'd like to once again thank Misha for being my guest today, and remember, please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.